According to Tales, it's made up of water. According to Heraclitus, the world is made up of fire. But I like what he said about Pythagoras. Pythagoras is the guy that gave us the Pythagoras theorem that said that in a right angle triangle, that if you take the individual squares and sum of the opposite and hypo opposite and, and adjacent, if you add them together, you have the square of the hypotenuse. He said that the world is made up of numbers. And if the world is made up of numbers, it means that the business of humanity is not in bad numbers. So whether you are building apps, whether you are building cliques, whether you are building computational models for we are working in a world that is made up of numbers. And that is how it all started. So, if the world is made up of numbers, it means the business of humanity is numbers. And that is the essence of all we do. And now the question began to be, if the world is number, how do we make sense of numbers? And that's how Charles Babbage, in 17th century, one of the finest mathematicians that ever lived, who gave us the difference engine, gave us one of the foremost computational systems to actually make it possible for us to make sense of numbers. And from that, we went through the time of UNIAC, UNIAC, to 1937, when they invented the transistor. The version of transistor became a quintessential moment in the history of science, because we were able to have the capacity to manipulate signal in what we call the active domain. That went shockingly. A Bell Laboratory in the United States invented it. But a big thing happened. Von Neumann, gave us the cell program concept. And as we celebrated the von Neumann in 1944, we had Jack Kibbe in 1957 gave us integrated circuits. The integrated circuit changed the world, redesigned the world, restructured the world, and made it possible for what we are talking about today. And then a young man in 1975 started a company called Microsoft around that time. Now, he now invented what we call the personal computing industry. You know, Bill Gates is a man I have had the opportunity of working with, stay in the same place, discussing things. And as he was doing that from Alar Ellison, Mark Zuckerberg, we now have a world of data, a world of data, changing in volume, veracity and variety. We cannot even make sense because everything has exploded. Next slide, please. And that is how it all started. But there is only one thing you know. When you have that massive set of data, the question now, how do you make sense of it? Ability to make sense of that can always tell us one thing. And I have this plot here. If you go back more than 500 years ago today, you will see that the gross world product was flat. I'm using the GDPs of the most important countries in the world today, the GDP of China and the GDP of the United States. These are the most important countries today. If you look here, the world was on stasis. The economic capacity of man was actually flat. In other words, GDPs of nations, we are not improving until you came around this time. It means that man was an inventive society, doing a lot of things, but not seeing any significant improvement in human standard. The human standard did not improve. The human welfare did not improve. And just what was really happening. But things started changing. Technology started being applied at scale. And then human standard of living started accelerating. And that's one thing I believe that when technology penetrates into any industrial sector, good things happen. And that is what we are seeing in the world of technology. So what I'm going to show you here today is that we are taking the whole construct of data analytics, the computational algorithm and model, to see how we can take that flattened life we are seeing here in Africa to one that begins to move exponentially. Because our capacity to unlock value in a GDP that is flattened to one that begins to grow, we make it possible that what will happen, the lifestyle of our people will improve. Because if you have a growing economy, it means that you are having a, a better job opportunity. It means that there will be more paths opportunity for people to have. So they told us that there will be more than 9.1 billion people by 2050. And we need to increase the food production by more than 70%. Because no matter how you think about it, your abs are not necessarily going to feed us. Somebody still has to go and plant the maize, plant the corn, or yam, everything. Somebody has to farm. So we like to make it so fanciful. Oh, I just have my, my agricultural app, and you think that the world has? No. So I figured out, go, next slide, please. 
But that is an opportunity what we can do. So in my company, we created Zenbus. Zenbus is um, basically an electronic system that if you put it in the soil, it collects information like temperature, moisture, humidity, electroconductivity of the soil, and then you send that data into a, a cloud server using either GSM Wi-Fi or satellite. And inside that cloud server, we have used some computational algorithms, extremely solid mathematical models to make sense of what is happening in that farm. <laughs> and, 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 as, and, as it have, and as those crops begin to grow, we have these special cameras, the, the Zenvos yield, that is built using what we call normalized different ve vegetative index. It's a kind of mathematical model, NDVI, that makes it possible that if you take a picture of a vegetation, you can use how the vegetation reflects sunlight, the ultramagnetic spectrum, to detect issues of pests, diseases, drought, and other things. So by taking that data, we can see in a farm where there are problems associated with drought versus diseases. So our camera, if you just put it on a bamboo stick, walk around the farm, you take the vegetative index, you put it into an algorithm, NDVI algorithm, and all of a sudden you say, hey, the southern part of this farm has a problem with drought. It's not getting enough moisture. Oh, the northern part seems to be experiencing a kind of an attack from pests. So what we are trying to do here is that by giving that information to farmers, they can now begin to make, next slide, bigger, better algorithm. So suddenly, if you are a farmer and you have Zenvos, you just go into your platform. You see the temperature of the farm, the temperature of the soil, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, uh, you know, I'm a farmer more than most of you here today. <laughs> because uh, what is happening, you just see, you can even predict to you in the next seven days whether it's going to rain or not. You know, one of the biggest difficulties we have in agriculture in Africa today is this. People make decisions using a guesswork technology. And when I say guesswork technology, it basically means that you're just making a decision without any data driving that. So somebody applies fertilizer this evening. And then suddenly tomorrow morning, rain falls for continuously for two days. The implication of that is that the rain will wash out the fertilizer. So technically, the farmer has not even applied any fertilizer. So then what to tell you is going to rain in the next two days. Please don't apply fertilizer. Because if you apply this fertilizer, it's not going to have any impact in the agricultural yield. Then what will also tell you, please, we are expecting rainfall in the next 72 hours. You don't have to do the irrigation now. Just wait a little bit because Mother Nature is going to irrigate for you. So what we are doing is that we are reducing power because power is what is used to pump the water that is used in irrigation. And we are also driving the optimization, conservation, utilization, efficiency in the application of water resource. You know, many of you understand this. Uh, this is the dendrite, this is the axon cylinder, and this is the neuron, this is the synapses. And it turns out that you can translate this biological system into a microprocessor. And the process of the translation of this biological system into a microprocessor, it gives you the capacity to emulate the human biology into an electrical circuit. So I spent time building such models it's event-driven, asynchronous parallelism of the central nervous system, where you begin to emulate the human biology into an electrical circuit. We now receive a lot of inspirations and are now translated that inspiration into the AI engine that drives Zenbus. So we are using models that are used for biology into agriculture because biology, agriculture is an organism. I'm trying to see how these things co correlate because when people are talking of AI, AI has been in existence forever. The only thing is that we just suddenly had the data to make use of the application of AI. There are so many elements that using the data from the farms, you can now use them for to uh, make loans. Let's say, for instance, you are a bank. You want to make loan to a farmer. 
And there are briefcase farmers in Nigeria, so many of them. But with Zambos, it's no more possible because in your office, we give you the capacity to see what is happening in that farm in real time. So if the man said he has used the money you, you, learned, you, you, you gave him to buy fertilizer and nothing changes in the delta differential of the nitrogen phosphorus, you know the man did not apply any fertilizer. And, and if suddenly you don't see, you know, so there is no way he can read it. And actually on this, we are working with the government in this. So we have these solutions. They will go live in uh, finish them or just trying to finalize some phases. Um, using the data from Zembos, farmers can insure their farms. Farmers can raise capital. Farmers can also um, have access, expand their market. The electronic farm diary one is already open and the price aggregation is, is ready. So we have essentially look at the 360 phase of the agricultural value chain. How do you improve the agricultural side? And how do you also make it possible that you can deliver services to farmers for them to actually do a lot of it? If you use Zenvos, just walk, walk around the boundary of a farm, it automatically generates a map, superimpose that map on a Google map, and when it superimpose, it calculates automatically the distance, the area, the perimeter, in hectare, and just tells you this is your farm. You know, some people are using it as a, as a kind of a surveyor. It's a surveyor that doesn't cost you anything. But it's very, very important because most farmers do not have data, the boundary data of their farms. But we want them to begin to have the capacity to register those farms with government. In short, in a state in the northern part of the country now, they are mapping with our solution and the idea is that once they finish mapping they will go and register with their local governments these farms so instead of people saying that my farm begins from 10 walks from the iroko tree by the side of the river uh, <laughs> you know he just giving out the, the zambo so our vision is that any farm in nigeria hopefully can become a part of the database that we are working right now with the Central Bank of Nigeria and also the Minister of uh, Agriculture. When you are making something, go beyond the needs of your customers, go beyond the expectations of your customers, and work at the level of the perception of your customers. The perception of your customers is something you build that even the customers never knew it was possible until the day they have the product. But the needs of your customers are things that they already know they need and you are just helping them fix that need. So by you have to come socialize with, come up with an idea that takes your business to the next level. You know that technology improves uh, competitive capabilities. And for Nigeria to diversify its economy, we have to figure out how we build the necessary capability that will help us get there. Technology improves productivity gains. And that means that it simplifies the process of any industrial sector. Uh, the transitioning process from a petroleum-driven economy into a possibly knowledge-driven economy, we have to happen for Nigeria to build into that model where we want to be. I think the government is doing what it can. The private sector also has to participate. But we need to move a little bit quicker because the era and the dawn of a post-mineral era, post-petroleum era, is just by the side of the corner.